Really, since the 1970s, you were a comedian that made it if you were on Saturday Night Live. Today's guest is no exception. These days, however, when he watches SNL, he doesn't recognize the show. Nobody recognizes the show. Uh, And he wouldn't make the roster because he's actually funny. He is extraordinarily irreverent, to say the least. Uh, the, the phrase comedian's comedian gets overused. Um, you know, uh, Bill Hicks is a comedian's comedian. It usually means that the comedian is too edgy or subversive for non-comedians to understand. I'm not a comedian, um, but I understand him, and he is still comedian's comedian. He is, it's brilliant writing. Unbelievably offensive, but brilliant. His uh, latest special, A Prison 10, is all the proof that you need on that. This man does not care about any lines. His comedy is so dark um, that you're kind of like, well, the apocalypse isn't so bad. The world is ending and there's nothing funny about it. Well, until you watch his special and then it's a little funny. There's no telling um, uh, how his jokes are going to end, Um, you know, slip on a banana peel and then end not on the street, but in the sewer. He is a very different thinker and very funny comedian. If you're a fan of Steven Crowder, you'll find this uh, nice to reminisce with an old friend. You will recognize him. Please welcome Dave Landau. Before we get into the comedy stuff, let me just tell you that with everything that's going on in the world, our relationship with China is not getting better. Um, And because of that, we're going to have some shortages. According to a University of Minnesota study, the U.S. relies on our antibiotics. 18 out of the 21 antibiotics come from overseas. 72% of all pharmaceutical ingredients overseas. That's not good. That's not good. That's actually really dangerous. If things escalate between us and China, we could be looking at a severe antibiotic shortage. I mean, you want to talk about going back to 1865. There it is. This is why I highly recommend the Jace case from Jace Medical. It's a great way to keep yourself prepared for the worst. It is a pack of five different courses of antibiotics that you can use to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, all kinds of stuff. So whether you are an ultimate prepper like I am and you understand what could be right around the corner, you get the Jace case. Or if you're just somebody that travels and you're going on a vacation with your family, don't get caught unprepared. JaceMedical.com. J-A-S-E Medical.com. Enter the promo code Beck at checkout and get a discount. Your perception of me, do you think I would be a fan of your comedy or not? Uh, Maybe the old you? (laughs) (laughs) I'm such a fan. I am such a fan. (laughs) But the good, wholesome, trying to be better part of me hates me for it. (laughs) You know, I watch, I'm so conflicted. Because you are, which my humor has always been very dark you are the darkest cavern i've ever experienced thank you your 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 comedy is so dark you said uh you were talking about you know end of the world and you brought up your son you know do you remember oh yeah yeah Yeah. can you just yeah express this yeah where he just says you know dad you know what i want to be when i grow up and i said it it doesn't matter (laughs) You, you know it's uh, it, it just explaining to him how the world's going to end. It's going to end. It know, just doesn't. A, yeah. Good night, son. It just doesn't matter. Yeah, he's seven. It's yeah. like, he's, he's the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's the day. So funny. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, what I, what the good part of me hates is that I just love all of your humor. And you are offensive in every possible way. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Cause I, <laughs> I don't know why I came you do it. No, but it is, you know, it is. Yeah. Of course. Cause that's, I mean, that's, 
Is that what you're striving for? Or you, you don't know. That's the odd part. Like I never want to look at because it's not necessarily that it's dirty. It's more that it's, it's filthy. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> graphically. Uh, it's no. It's honest. Yes. And that's the way that I look at it. Is a lot right. of times honesty is going to be that way. Right. So I don't necessarily go to be offensive. I just go for the joke. But in today's world, I mean. It is. There wasn't one. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the way you craft jokes, it's like, oh, that's going to piss off people. Oh, here's another group of people that's going to piss off. All in the same joke. Right. You'll have like three <laughs> levels of people that are just want to set you on fire. Yes. <laughs> What I like to do is I like to like the end of the joke with the tag. Yes. I like to find eight more things that oh, are more offensive that make the beginning offensive <laughs> part less offensive. And and that's what I enjoy is watching a oh crowd. Oh my gosh. Because you get an honest break though from people. Right. Because if they're cracking at something like that, you know that there's this there's this honest part of them that actually enjoys that. Right. Because there's so much we have to hide now in our society and like what we think is funny. So and bad. What we, yeah. Why not just say it? Why not just right. have fun? Because I even. But when it's I, not. I mean, the things you say are true, but some of the things are uh, are really uh, offensive, and it's not as true as it is. I want to be able to laugh at that. Yes. You know, it's a. It's clearly, a, at least I hope some of them are jokes, but it's clearly a joke. Um, but y y you, you give us permission to laugh, and nobody is doing that. It, at least, I mean, Thank Chappelle you. does it, but I think you're a level down from, Le Ch Le I mean, into that dark hole. Yeah, You're a level down. You are more dangerous with your comedy than I think anybody else out there. Thank you so much. Honestly, and I, I worked with Chappelle a few times I when I, I started, right. and he's one of you my heroes. You opened for him. Yeah, yeah. And this was when it was like, I opened for him for 7,000 people where it was, you know, people were just going crazy, but they were all heckling. It was at a time when he was supposedly going insane. And then when he, you know. when <laughs> I remember those days. Yeah, and then he walked. Yeah, right. And then when he came back, it was amazing. And it was, and now he's. What was the difference when he. When he left, because I remember this, he didn't he sign to do a show and everybody thought he was crazy because he he left behind all that money and possible mm. stardom. And I remember thinking he is either crazy or I really like him because yeah. he knows the price of his soul and he just sold out. Yeah, he, he always said he said his mom told him she made 30 grand a year as a teacher. He said, if I can make that as a comic, I'm happy. Everything else is icing on the cake. So when they offered him more money and more money to do things that he didn't agree with and censor him, which is part of his contract to not do, he walked. And then when he came back, he did exactly what he wanted to do. And now he's, oddly enough, a white supremacist and people attack <laughs> him and try to stab him on right. stage. And it's like he's only arguably one of the gr top five greatest comedians ever. Yeah, who we try to time. take down. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, he, yeah, he's such a hero to me, you know. And with the darkness, that's just my life. That's who I, I am. Mm -hmm. So if I wasn't talking about something that is dark or I take a nugget of truth that, oh my like my wife and I, or my uh, my son and I, when we were sitting at our house pre-COVID is one of the jokes. And he wants, I have to teach him about death because I take him to meet my parents at the cemetery. <laughs> and, you know, one of the lines is they still vote. <laughs> and, you know, he gets to right. the cemetery and then we, he's like, oh, you get him a goldfish. That's how they learn <laughs> right, about right, death. Right. You flush him. So instead right. I get him a cat. Oh, my gosh. You know, and I'm like, you completely clogged up our toilet. And we're just <laughs> sitting there, you know. I, like we, I have to <laughs> tell you. It's just so perfectly crafted. And, Thank you. And uh, for somebody who is, I think, a connoisseur of dark comedy, uh, there's just nobody better at it than you. That right means now. the world. Seriously. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so do you know who Kurt Garan is? I don't. Okay, you should. Okay. Um, he was... Um, the biggest, most powerful star in the 1930s. And uh, he would go to, he was a movie star, but he was also a comedian. Um, he was kind of like Tom Hanks in, in, of his day, you know, or uh, Will Ferrell. Okay. Everybody loved him. Uh, and he went into the cabarets and he started doing Nazi jokes 
from like 1928 to 1933. Right. He ended up... Uh, a little edgy. Yeah, he yeah. ended up in a concentration camp <laughs> oh. uh, and was killed. It was a uh, yeah. horrible, horrible, horrible story. Um, but if things go poorly, if we don't turn around... Good news, that could be you. I know, I'm excited for it. <laughs> I'm excited for the comedian camps. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, I, are we getting further away from that? Because it, I, I don't mean that literally, but yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah. maybe. So, you know, we're going, maybe. But there was no one. There was, I, I kept saying, where's Lenny Bruce? Is there not one Lenny Bruce that is willing to stand up to this? No one, it seemed. And now, th- there's, it's, it's a renaissance. Yes. When you have people, and you know, they've been on the show, you have Jim Brewer, you have, mm-hmm. uh, you have people Funny. that are, are willing to step up. And I think it's not even so much to make a stand as much as it is talk about the things that are going on. Mm-hmm. And even when I talk about, for example, trans, I do it from a point of, I talk about me. Like if I was to compete as a woman, uh, it would make no difference whatsoever. And I'm able to point that out where <laughs> I just talk about, you know, I'm at the end of the swimming pool. My balls are hanging out. They're like, who's this fat girl? I think she has emphysema, no sports skills whatsoever. You know, and there's a way to point out the the lunacy of everything that's happening, mm-hmm. you know, without necessarily being antagonistic in the sense of you have to be offended, I think, in, in certain ways because you're choosing to be. You're choosing to be a part of something that is brainwashed to be offensive. Mm -hmm. You know, the currency of today is to be offended. The currency today is to be a victim. It makes no sense to me at all. It goes against what I think human nature is. So eventually I think, yeah, we're going to have to either, either comics are going to have to step up, start growing some balls and go back to being comics that are actually doing what they're supposed to do, Mm -hmm. which is genuinely making people laugh with their own beliefs and their own jokes and also, you know, artists, but I think comedians more so, are the, usually the ones that bring us into revolution, and they're the ones who bring us out of the dark side because of that, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Um, because they, they poke at our conscience. You know, George Carlin was brilliant at that. 100%, right out of Vietnam, too. Right. And he... He made you think you'd laugh your ass off, but you'd go, "What? Maybe he's right on that. Maybe I should con- recon." You know, he had a message to him. I, I hate messages, but he did it well. He did it really well. And there we went for a while where there there was no one willing to stick their neck out. Yeah, for a long time. Well, and Carlin died in '08. And some of the stuff he said, you could do on stage right now, and it would be just as important. Oh, yeah. That's what's, that's what's so crazy about yeah. his last special. Mm-hmm. And with Carlin, it, it wasn't so much about a message. He just wasn't pandering to anybody. Right. So he was saying, yes. this is what's wrong with everybody. This is what's wrong with all humanity. And this is the problem. And he went out and he said it first. It's why Pryor is so well liked because he brought attention to a group of people that weren't really being, you know, uh, shined on in any mainstream light other than Cosby, who was very, very likable up until some incident. <laughs> um, something I, happened. I, I watched that with my kids when they were younger, and oh. I felt so bad. I kept watching it going, when do I tell them that, when I found that out, he's a rapist? <laughs> when I found out my, my wife was pregnant, I bought the, I didn't buy it, I used my dad's copy of Father. <laughs> that he had had uh-huh. and I read it on the plane and then three days later I was like oh that's <laughs> that's good maybe I shouldn't take all the advice I'll never book. forget yeah. my kids they'd watch Cosby you know for 10 years we watched the whole thing and uh and I'm you know episode two I'm saying to my wife I'm not sure if this is a good idea because at some point we have to tell them who he is <laughs> and I remember after this you know, after all of the episodes I'm like okay this is a good way and a good time to talk about you may not, you may like someone's work, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the person. And they were like, he did what? Yeah. Like he, he, he raped. Uh, 
<laughs> Bill Cosby. But, yeah, who? But serial Everyone? rape. <laughs> I mean, yeah. For like 30 years. Yeah, but just that was flying. it. I mean, it <laughs> wasn't It wasn't as... Well, it was most of his career. Right. Uh, he's in jail, right? right. Well, well, not now. No. <laughs> oh, he was in there for a while? No. They did take away his fake college degrees, though. That taught him. That's what I loved about it, where they're like, we're taking your fake diplomas. Oh, good. That's, that's going to learn them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's hard because you watch himself and you go, it's arguably, no matter what you say, one of the greatest specials ever put on right. tape. I mean, it just is. And But you wonder, is this a guy who's such a sociopath? He nailed being a comic that's perfect. At being this family friendly, you know, like no he, one would suspect. Yeah, there was no edge. Necess- it wasn't that it was no edge because it was good, but there was just this perfect, like, I'm catering to human beings in every way possible. And I, no one's ever done that the way nobody has ever been as likable as a comic as Bill Cosby, in my opinion. So if you go by that, how many people have Jim Gaffigan raped? I mean, oh. <laughs> Because he kind of has, he has edge, but yeah. he's the same guy. He's, yeah, yeah. Everybody kind of likes Jim Gavigan. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves him. <laughs> right. I, he's got a real problem with food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be weird if that came out. Thank God he has like 50 kids, I heard. So maybe that's... <laughs> his wife he's getting it at him. home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His wife's yeah. like, listen. You could be Cosby quickly. Let's just... Yeah, he's just putting on a mask <laughs> right. and trying to get out to the BTK van. And she's like, look... <laughs> Uh, back with Dave here in a second. I I, I was going to start this with, you know, you and I work hard for our money. Um, and then I realized, no, this is what I do. So you work hard for your money. I am just faking it. Anyway, I know even though I don't really earn my money, uh, I have taken my hard-earned money and I use it uh, the best way I can to help America, to help um, to help build the things that I think we need to build. It's, it's not only a patriotic thing, it's a quality thing. Traditionally, things that are made in America always been last longer, work better, set the standard for the rest of the world. Well, when it comes to clothing and things like that, you can't do that. And any company that tries, it is an uphill battle. And that's why Grip6 is a sponsor of mine. That is a true American experience, products that you can count on. When you buy their socks, you're supporting American ranchers who raise specially bred sheep here in America that produce the modern wool, the American manufacturers who wash the wool, process it, and then weave it into socks that will keep your feet warm in the winter and cool in the summer. This is one of the American business owners that have, I mean, they have taken the hard road to make it the best American-made product with American labor out there. Check out Grip6 today. Grip6. Go to grip6.com slash Beck today. That's grip6.com slash Beck. Five best comedians. Can be of all time or today. I would say Dave Chappelle, uh, George Carlin, uh, Robert Schimmel. Um, boy, that's tough. Uh, there's so many. Eddie Murphy. What happened to him? I think I think what happened to Eddie Murphy was just he was attacked so ruthlessly by the press that you have to look at a guy who was so unbelievably talented, made some bombs, and they couldn't stand that he didn't live up to his own hype. Like he was a 19 year old kid, 20 year old kid when he did delirious people forget that. So they were insanely unforgiving to him whenever he made something that wasn't good. So it, which ended up being a lot of things, but he still made some really good movies. Oh, he made great movies. And, I and remember, it was really funny. Yeah. And I remember when, like with, when he got nominated for the Oscar for dream girls and they said it was when he looked at the camera before he was about to shoot up the way that he looked at the camera and he, during an interview, and he's like, you know, I was in a movie where I played nine people. <laughs> you know, like he still right. had it where it's like, right. no, it, the talent will always, was always there, is right. always there. Um, I think with him, they just cut him down in such a way because he was the first 
sort of mega star to break right. at that very young age in the 80s in that comedy boom. And your every movie you make is not going to live up to Beverly Hills Cop and no. 48 Hours and these are like masterpieces of comedy. So wh- you can't expect everything so to work. So what does he do now? I think he just does voiceovers in his basement and makes forty million. You know what I mean? I don't think it's too bad. I think he's no, fine. I'm not saying that. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah. It, does he want to exercise that muscle anymore? He says that he does, but I can only imagine having been trashed the way that he he has been. Why would you want to go out and go? Okay, I have to make something that live up to Delirious and Raw, where you're you know twenty and twenty five, and now you're uh, he's got to be what approaching sixty, I would assume. Yeah, but he should. Do I mean, it. Louis C.K. is still out there. You want to yeah, be talking yeah. about trashed? Oh yeah, I mean, and Louis C.K. proved that it. Did, and I was so glad he came back because Me too. you know I'm going to put Louis in the top five as well. Um, I think he's phenomenal, so I'm going to put him obviously in the top five as well. Uh, and Patrice O'Neill, actually, if I I don't know if I've named Patrice six. Patrice O'Neill, I don't think I've seen her. Uh, him. 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 Patrice O'Neill, big black dude. Always a, and Anthony. Always a male? Uh, with always a, name a guy. Pa- a whole guy. Uh, no, no, he passed okay. a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always <laughs> always a dude. Um, he put out an album mm-hmm. called Elephant in the Room. Or a special. Mm-hmm. One of the funniest specials ever where he's talking about uh, a girl who went missing in Aruba. And he's like, well, what's her name? And the whole audience goes, Natalie Holloway. And he goes, right, right. And he goes, and the other girl he killed, the, um, the, the, the <laughs> Hispanic girl, what? Well, Nobody says anything. He goes, yeah, exactly. No one cares. They just sent a. They just sent some guy out to the end of a pier to be like, "Yeah, we don't see her." <laughs> it's like he did this. It was. It was one of the most. It's one of the best specials I've ever seen. It's oh, perfect. It's offensive. It's great. It's so, like, and he was somebody who took a risk every time he was on on mic. I think one of the best comedy writers and comedians, and I'm surprised he wasn't on your list, is Ricky Gervais. Oh, Gervais for sure. I mean, that's why it's so tough to... And Gervais has heart, too, in a way, especially with his show that he put out recently and the way that his... Yeah, 100%. Have you seen... uh, What is it? The BBC series that he did, Derek, I think? Have you ever watched that? Uh, I haven't seen Derek, no. You you should watch it. I'll watch it, It, though, for sure. First of all, it's very dark, but... It's about a guy. He plays a handicapped guy, um, and he has to live in a nursing home with a bunch of old people. And there's this one character that is so offensive, so offensive, that it's hard to watch. And he doesn't fit. You know, it's just all of a sudden, everything's going to... And then this guy comes in so offensive. But you watch the arc. I mean, he's brilliant with heart. He is yes. just brilliant. Yeah, there's he's like a um, uh, Hughes. What was his name? He made the comedian. He made a bunch of stuff with uh, John Candy, uh, uh, the director and writer. Oh, uh, uh, not Harold Ramis. No, but, no, no. Uh, Hugh, uh, oh, John Hughes. John Hughes. See, that's what's missing today. John Candy is one of my all-time favorites. Just not too. a stand-up, and I yeah. think John Hughes is missing because Uncle Buck, Trains, Planes, and Automobiles. Yeah. These are movies. Yeah, they don't make those anymore. No. I've been saying it forever. Where you just you love the character. Right. There's this schlub. There's a reason these people exist. You don't. There's no heart anymore to anything like that. I think that's you know. Um, but no, I, but Gervais, his last one about the one where his wife dies, and he's completely, you know, he just hates everyone yeah. as a result of it. Oh, yeah, 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 and, yeah. And there's... Dead, what is it? Uh, uh, I forget the name of it. Afterlife. Afterlife. Yeah. It's brilliant. Brilliant. And you brilliant. see him turn around at the end, and, yeah. and there's so much heart there. Yeah. And that's what I love about Gervais is... Me too. ...is that's the underlining thing. There's always this theme, and... So, uh, you know Red Skelton? Yes. So Red Skelton said... Um, you can go see a clown at the circus and you will just remember you saw a bunch of clowns at the circus. Yeah. But the clown that can make you laugh and cry, you will never forget. Yep. And that's Ricky Gervais. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, he's brilliant. I so mean, did you ever see life's too short? No, I don't think so. It was a show he made with Warwick Davis who played like leprechaun and, and uh, he was in Willow and they just, <laughs> they just hate him. 
So they do stuff like they make the door on their office. They put the knob a little bit too high <laughs> so he can't get in. It's just, it's just, it's like deliberately uh, cheap, but it's so funny because uh, Warwick is willing. What's to it take, called again? Uh, life is life's too life's short. Life's too short. I gotta look that up. It's brilliant. In uh, one episode, he's being trolled by this this kid constantly on MySpace, attacking him for being a dwarf. So he finds him, goes to the school, walks into the classroom, and just starts ripping this kid apart where everybody's laughing. And then it cuts back to the kid and he's just in a wheelchair with a blow straw <laughs> and then he realizes he starts feeling bad so at the end he's like well I, you know I just felt he kind of deserved it and like <laughs> behind him it's just the kid in the blow chair with like kick me on the back of it kids are chucking backpacks at him and it's just like this it was so funny and, and like only like Gervais and somebody with enough vulnerability like Warwick Davis right. could have pulled it off yeah um, you you I have a, a very dark sense of humor, but I know where that came from. Mm -hmm. um, Gervais has a very dark sense of humor. You're one of the darker ones I've yeah. seen. Where does that come from with you? Uh, a lot of places. I grew up in, I grew up in uh, Gross Point Woods, which bordered Detroit. Okay, that's enough. Yeah, right there. Uh, <laughs> right off 8 Mile. Uh, right. Saw a lot of stuff. Uh, my dad was, uh, well, my mom was kind of like a bipolar nurse. And my dad. A nurse for people with bipolar? No, or no, no. she had she, bipolar? She was a great nurse. Okay. She just wasn't good at treating her own bipolar. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And my dad got Agent Orange in Vietnam. And uh, they, he ended up with a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And the government was very kind. They gave us absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. and they didn't. They didn't address it at all. And in his insurance company was. I know like, this sounds bad, but I I kind of wish we'd returned to those days on a lot of fronts with the government, where yeah. they did nothing for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, yeah, they just well, they didn't help at all. And yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The the insurance company as well was like, sure, you've been paying us, but maybe you've wow. had it forever. So. Wow. He ended up having to pay out of pocket. My dad was my hero. He ran uh, Babe Ruth Little League for everybody. He was everybody's coach. He was, and he got sick when uh, I was about 14. He ended up passing away, which then led to my mom's suicide. And that uh, That's where mine came from. So we have a, very, a lot in common. Yeah. Your mom as well? Yeah, when I was 14 or 15. Yeah. I'm very sorry to hear yeah. that. My, yeah, I was a little older than my mom did, but my dad yeah. died when I was a teenager. Yeah, bad. Yeah, I was I was on stage a couple of days ago, and a kid in the crowd said he had been in the back of a police car. I said, "Why?" He said, "Well, my girlfriend's mom killed herself." I was like, oh, "I had to, just dug myself quite a hole." Probably not. <laughs> said, "Probably not as deep as the one they dug for her." And then I said, "Don't worry, my mom." I said, "My mom, my mom killed herself yeah. uh, as well. Don't yeah. worry about it." But it was right after we had our kid. And she would be like, could I babysit? And I'd be like, I don't know, Mom, because if you get depressed like an hour in, you're going to have to at least hang yourself from the ceiling fan <laughs> so he's got a mobile to look at. <laughs> and it's the only way that I could justify, like, the... Right. Because I loved my mom. Right. I just... She, she lost her mind after my dad passed. Mm -hmm. And because she was older, she worked as a, a candy striper and then became a nurse... And she'd work in mental wards. And as a result of that, she never got help. And she knew how to, she would attempt suicide and then talk her oh way out of gosh. it like that. Because she knew what to say. Right. She was smarter than them. So she would just say whatever. And they'd go, well, yeah, you shouldn't be here. Obviously, you clearly drank a bottle of Vicodin on accident. <laughs> go home. Right. You know, and so my dad would go around the country trying to pay out of pocket. So my dad, who went from nothing when we were born to a millionaire, lost everything. And I ended up being raised by my aunt, mm. my, my, or my aunt, various aunts. My, the woman who was watching us was a very close family friend. She ended up killing herself. Did you ever start to think maybe? I thought maybe it's me. Yeah. I'm going, am I the common denominator? Right. Do I A lot snore? of people killing themselves I, around yeah, me. I just sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she had, been, she had been stealing pills from uh, work. She was an ER nurse. And they, she got caught. And one day she didn't come home. And I'm like, this is weird. And then she didn't come home again. But because I was now a teenage drug addict, I was like, well, I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm just going to throw parties. And then when I went to her house to check, she had, you know, she had uh, swallowed a handful, died in her bathtub. And then I was watched by other aunts and stuff. Mm. And I remember it because she got very mad when she found out that I had smoked pot. 
very angry. And I was like, this is weird. She lets me smoke cigarettes and shoot pool and like what, you know, but she got nuts at me. And I realized it was a projection of her own addiction. Correct. So after that, uh, I just kind of, I didn't go to, I gave up on going to school. I didn't really have any ambition other than possibly going to second city to, to do comedy, but I didn't really believe in much. And I was arrested 13 times over the course of from what age to what age I was <clears throat> arrested mostly from 16 to mm. 20 and then Oof. once at 27. And that's when my sobriety started and jail time. Uh, just jail, not prison. <laughs> so Good just, for you. Yeah, I'm not so much. Good for you. I'm not a I'm not so, yeah, I didn't yeah. break federal no, laws. No, I mean, come on. It was, it was just some theft and four DUIs. <laughs> right, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Passing that's out it. at a red light in a toga. Mm. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a stop sign. <laughs> Actually, you know, I thought it was a stop sign. I thought it was a red light. <laughs> I was like, this thing. Oh, that was a bad day. Because I, I was waiting at a stop sign. And I thought it was a red. So I started snorting ketamine off of a road map. You know, an animal tranquilizer. Right. You know, to yeah. wake me up. <laughs> right. And I, I passed out. And, uh, they, and who hasn't done that with oh, their road well, map? clearly, it's what they were for. <laughs> yeah, kids are not kids today. Where do they do their ketamine? You know, right. off their phone? That's why it's so amazing that it's for depression now. I'm like, what do you think I was doing it for? <laughs> I, I could have told you that in 98. <laughs> so, like, I, uh, I ended up uh, getting woken up by the police. And they're like, what are you doing? And I said, my, my car stalled. And they said, it's running. <laughs> and I said, it must have restarted. <laughs> and then they arrested me. And they walked me into <clears throat> the jail because it turned out I was in front of the police station. Mm. So it was these different things where I would get, and then Whippets was another one, where uh, nitrous was very popular in, mm -hmm. the, in the 90s in Detroit. And in the late 90s, I went, probably like 2000, I went to a store in Detroit and I was trying to buy like 30 cans of whipped cream in like mid-August. <laughs> and the guy's like, what are you going to use these for? I'm like, uh, ice cream social. And mind you, I'm wearing like a full track suit. I have a sideways hat and chains. And the guy's like, it's just taking them behind the counter. He's like, I'm not selling you these. I'm like, yeah, you are. He's like, no, I'm not. So I'm like trying to reach for him. He's like, I'm going to call the cops. I'm like, oh, okay. So I, I walk outside and I start giving them the finger and there were these two liters and I just started filling my car with the two liters. Like these are mine now. I'm hammered. <laughs> and then I notice a cop and I'm like, oh, so I, I start waving to the guy all politely. Like, thank you for all the two liters, sir. <laughs> and I get in and I drive away. I get pulled over a few minutes later to the day I got my license. I got a DUI. The day I got in a high speed chase and crashed my car into a tree. On the day the you day got, got my license. Yeah, my dad let me borrow his car, and uh, he regretted it. Yeah. And it was a little bit after he just got diagnosed, so you can tell that— So you hadn't proven yourself to be— Not yet. —a complete moron. No, not yet. No, mm -hmm. no, no. He, he was worried, but my dad, fortunately, at that time— I shouldn't say fortunately, but I, I think his brain hadn't been going yet. And my dad right. was very funny. He was like Dangerfield. Like, he would— really make jokes about anything, really had a great sense of humor and was tough as nails. I mean, he had a halo in drilled to his head for a year and a half and he would go golfing and he didn't take painkillers. It was crazy. But he, the day he loaned me the car is when he started to worry about me because I'd never been arrested before. I was 16 and I got in a high speed chase because I was giving people lawn jobs, mm -hmm. going under their lawn, you know, ripping it up, you know, and I decided to do it in front of a guy who was sitting in a BMW and I had a Buick Regal. <laughs> and so we ended up in this high speed chase and we were having a family reunion at the time. So I smash into a tree. Now, all my friends who were still conscious run. I'm unconscious by the airbag. <laughs> so it's just me. And what I didn't know, even though he had gone down to the hood to get liquor, was the trunk was filled with a bunch of party supplies for the party the next day. So the, the trunk pops open and for like a half a mile is potato <laughs> chips and beer and liquor just leading to me unconscious <laughs> in a car. And, and then I wake up and I see my dad and I walk out and my dad's never been violent to me. 
And I walk out and I go, Dad, don't worry, I'm okay. And he just hit me in the face <laughs> and knocked me out the second time that evening. And then I get woken. I finally wake up and the cop seriously goes, he's awake if you want to hit him again. <laughs> Completely on my day. You know, they knew exactly what had happened. Six months suspended license, though, at that time. Kind of a slap on the wrist. Different time. And then from then on, the more my dad was gone, the more my family was gone. I just, I had abandonment issues, which was not their fault, but I was just kind of lost. Sure. I had, you know, I just sort of uh, went to a You're very- You're saying family's important? Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. You know, it's it's almost yeah. like you need them. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, so I was being raised by my friends who could stay out all night. And a lot of them, the ones who could stay out all night, were dealing with certain issues at home. And the ones that had good home lives were going home. And I ended up addicted to drugs and alcohol for years. How I'm, far down that rabbit hole did you go? Very, very, very. I mean, 13 arrests and I was a... Sh I, if I didn't drink, and this was by the time I was a senior in high school, I remember I went to eat rice at uh, Eastland Mall in Detroit at a food court. And when I went to eat the rice, my hand was shaking so bad from withdrawals. It was like mm. going everywhere. And my friend Stu's like, do you have Parkinson's? He's just like ripping on me. And I'm like, I got to go to the bathroom. And I drove down the street, grabbed some liquor from the liquor store. And I just slammed it to drive back so I could sit down and finish eating my food. Wow. And that was the moment I'm like, I realized I was a severe alcoholic. And then when I finally ended up in rehab and felt what it was like to detox, I knew that I had some serious problems. So you were really just addicted to uh, alcohol? Alcohol was my main thing, but I did, I mean, I was a dry sold weed, I did everything, but my alcohol was my main thing, eventually cocaine, because I wanted to stay up to drink, Correct. and LSD was everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did... Yeah, we ballpark at like 350, 400 hits. Jeez. Yeah. What do you think of this new trend where LSD is cool again and it's good for you? I don't believe it. I mean, it, if there is some sort of idea to microdosing with mushrooms that actually cures depression and there's people that believe it, it can prove it, I'd be interested in truthfully seeing it. Mm -hmm. I like to see the facts. Mm -hmm. Um LSD, because of where it comes from and the way that it was made and the way that it's sort of a mind control, mm -hmm. I, 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 don't think it, I don't think it was good for me because I have a thing called HPPD and I still get the occasional, you know, something will move. I don't understand things. I have a concept of time that's not necessarily really? right. Oh, yeah. There's like a division of like when I started doing hallucinogens versus when I didn't. And mm. I have like two separate lives. And I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that until my doctors, you know, diagnosed me with it. Mm. So I, I just wouldn't do it. You know, and I've had friends who are like 40 now who yeah. are like, I think I want to try acid. And I'm like, at 40? <laughs> like when you're 16, you don't have to worry about it. See, anything. I have the different advice. I, I became an alcoholic and... Now, as an adult with teenagers, I need those blackouts. <laughs> I wasted them on nothing. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying I don't miss a good yeah. one. Yeah. Don't piss those away, man. You only have so many of those. Yeah, I can still get a hangover, though. I just have to eat ice cream and then wake up the next day, and I feel like I've been doing keg stands all night. It's wonderful. So, yeah, I guess, you know, really, though, I guess to, for how it went was just different dark things happen in my life and making jokes with my friends. It's how I just dealt with it. Sitting here talking to another alcoholic uh, and, and who had similar life growing up. Uh, I know the danger of um, drugs, eat, no matter how much pain you're in. Uh, man, drugs can be very, very dangerous. So how do you kill a constant nagging pain without blowing holes through your stomach or being addicted to something? I have found Relief Factor. And once I began taking it, almost all of my pain, well, all of my pain did go away almost all of the time. I still have flashes of it, but I, I, I wasn't able to use my hands or anything um, most of the time. It was awful. Please give Relief Factor a shot. 
Try it. Relief Factor. Not a drug, so it's not going to whack you out. ReliefFactor.com. Three-week twix, uh, quick start is nineteen ninety five. It's a trial pack. Do it now. ReliefFactor.com or 800-THE-NUMBER-4-RELIEF. A lot of people know you as, you know, the co-host with Steven Crowder. Yes. You, you still talk to him because he's fallen off the map and... Yeah, the, uh, he, well, he had the issue with the Daily Wire uh, yeah, that was very public. Um, I believe he's coming back, though. You do? Yeah. Good. We miss I him. Do. Yeah, I know a lot he's of people. He's very funny. A lot, yeah, a lot of people really want him back. Yeah. Um, uh, when you look at um, people who are doing comedy, let's say Saturday Night Live, mm. and you see the people that are on there, now, do you think they know they've sold out that they're they're shills, or are they just have they just finally just hired a <laughs> bunch of people who are really not funny, just not you know? It used to be everybody was really funny; yes. they just didn't know how to finish it. Yeah, the, now it's like it's the ending of every scene well, is the whole scene. Yeah, I agree. It feels like it's written by the CIA it every does. time you watch, doesn't it? It does. It really is uncomfortable. Yeah. And then you see Update, and I kind of go, okay, they're comics. I, I do think they are. You know, I think Colin Jost knows what he's doing. You know, I think, but the rest of the show, it just feels like it's a forced thing. It's like, I used to like Colbert. Mm-hmm. And Me then too. once you saw the dancing vax needles, I was like, why would you allow that ever? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine even Johnny Carson coming out there or no. and, uh, even Leno? No. Anybody. Nobody would have done it. It's insane. Nobody that's would have done a, it. that's an agenda. It's right. propaganda. And, and it's and you've 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 also it's not that that is that screams propaganda. It was so terrifying in a way to see those dancing mm -hmm. needles. Um uh but it's like people just write off half the country now. Yes. Where Carson would have never done that. No. Never done that. It was for everybody to enjoy. Yeah. And that's the part where if you don't enjoy something on, on accident or because by default you're offended or you don't like it, that's fine. I mean, comedy's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's going to like you. But now it's deliberate division and that's what they want. Yeah. And that's what the, it's what the entire mainstream outlets are. It's to make a group of people hate another group of people. And unfortunately, everything in the mainstream is designed to make you detest. It's not even just right. It's anything outside of their dogma. Yes. It's uh, a religion. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it's extreme. It's hard to even call it left. At this point, because people can look at liberal and I can look at liberal and go, well, I'd say I was liberal. I don't. That's why I don't call it liberal anymore. Yeah. I, don't, I don't. I'm uncomfortable calling it Democrats. Yeah. There are Democrats that I know that vote Democrat. Right. And they don't buy into all this. crap. No. They're strangely not standing up against it. Um, but that's different. There is the power is in the uber dangerous left. Absolutely. And that's why it's where they land. But we're at a point now where people are doing things to be liked, but what they're doing is extreme. And what they're doing is, is it's violent, it's wrong, and it's very much to be liked. And we're living in a thing where outrage is currency. So why? Why is that something you want to be a part of? And it's not even, you know, it comes down to we have arguments of... It, People use trans or they use this or they use that and they want to use victimhood and they want to use everything else or be a part of this. I don't feel that this is how everybody feels. I don't feel that there should be this constant training of division to make you feel oh. like you're nothing. Yeah. And that's what it's it is. Evil. It I, is. It is. It, 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 I've talked to several people and many of them atheists uh, yeah. or agnostic. Yeah, right. Like, you know, this is a very religious word, but I don't know how to describe telling people you are nothing. Um, you will never be anything unless you get them. Yep. That's, that's just evil. Well, and to blame somebody else. That's the idea. You're never going to be anything because of that guy. Why would you believe that? 
And then you have an entire institution, you have college, all that, higher learning, and the idea is you go there and a professor teaches you that you can never amount to anything because you were born into a color, and then this other color has everything but doesn't deserve it. And this has to somehow be switched. So you're being trained that you should never be anything because you can't be. Unless you take it. Right. And the other part is being taught that they are worthless and that they need to check Mm -hmm. themselves in every way possible. And I have a son. It's like, I don't buy into that. How old is he? He's going to be eight this weekend. So uh, judging by the way the world's going, it's going to be a good last birthday. (laughs) Good last year. (laughs) You you have to be. I mean, I have teenagers. I'm terrified for the world. And they have gone to the age where they have asked me, so, Dad, I know you're really pessimistic, um, what's my life going to be like? And uh, the honest answer is, I don't know. It could be really great. It could be really bad. But I grew up in a time that was a blip in human history. It's always been that, you know? Yes. But uh, do you think the American age is over? <sighs> I think social media ruined it. I think because I think technology ruined it. I think technology evolved a lot quicker than people did. Oh, yeah. And I think that's the dangerous part is I do believe in freedom of speech and that everybody should have a voice. When did we stop saying, I so strongly disagree with you, but I'll fight to my last breath for you to be able to say it? Right. And the problem is, is I've learned, though, that a lot of the people on social media, eh, maybe shouldn't talk. (laughs) I've always always thought of it as we've all, we know these people were around us. I mean, we always had the guy on the street or the family on the street that everybody else on the street would go, kids do not play. (laughs) Don't (laughs) don't go over there. Just don't go over there. If they're talking to you, just, just keep walking on. Pretend you didn't hear it. Everybody had that. But now they have connected with everybody else's person on the street. And so they have this voice. It's the same voice it's always been. It's just in our face and being used now to terrify all of us. And everything's being used for fear, including a Ring doorbell app. Like I have that where all of a sudden I just want to make sure everything's safe at my house. I have mm-hmm. cameras in the back. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I had to I had to become a gun owner for my own safety, and it was because of threats that I had gotten from being on like the Kumia show. And so all of a sudden, in my Ring doorbell app, I'm getting stuff from you know other people that have it. Like, there's an ambulance on this street. Does anybody know why? It's like, I think you're a little too worried, but it's people that are shut-ins that are always worried about everything. And now they're afraid because they're telling the whole neighborhood what to think and feel and they're worried. And it's, it's this, it's a market of fear. So are you, I mean, I might be one of those ring people. Fair. That are, that are like, <laughs> I, cause we're I sponsored want, sponsored by ring. I that? want, I want, <laughs> I love that technology. I, I love too, yeah. the ease of everything, but I don't trust the gathering of all of that information when it comes to those companies now getting in bed with the government, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want you having, you know, a complete visual contact of me all the time. Not like I'm coming home, you know, drenched in blood, but no, I could, I (laughs) could. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And then I really don't want it to work. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But I just don't want that intrusion and there's no one to trust. It seems. No, and they're selling your information out. Yeah. They're, I remember when I got a pager and I was, I don't know, 16. And my dad's like, excuse me, doctor. And I'm like, what? He's like, why do you have a pager? <laughs> and I'm like, I, you know, my uh, friends want to. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, exactly. I'm like, my friends want to get a hold of me, right. you know, in case they're near a pay phone and need a dime back. <laughs> but he's like, why, why do you really need one? And I'm like, I, I don't know. It's what we, we have them. He goes, don't you think it's dangerous how easy it is for people to get a hold of you? Yes. And this is in the 90s. But it really bothered him because then it was right when like the internet came out and he liked technology, but he just kept finding it scary how there was this beginning of no privacy. And this was, you know, he passed long before any of this stuff. Yeah. 
But even then, he was warning me about what was going on, how this seems like it's a very, very slippery slope into where you will never have a moment of a day where you can be left alone. Well, if you look at what the World Economic Forum is saying, if you look at even uh, Ray Kurzweil or Stephen Hawking, yeah, we're talking about things that are so far beyond our understanding because man's never faced anything like this. With AI and all of the stuff is coming, that could be the most dangerous cage that nobody ever gets out of except the ruling elite. Um, But they might actually be trapped by, you know, a a form of AI that grows beyond them. It, It is... The acting elite in Hollywood may be ruined by AI because oh, yeah. it's like, oh, we have actors oh, with no ego. Yeah. They're like, oh, that's great. Yeah. We don't have to pay them? Right. Oh, it's wonderful. That can completely get, uh, completely happen. There's I, no doubt about it. I mean, in a very selfish way. I mean, when it gets good enough, I thought, I'm going to fake my death, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, and just hide it. And then uh, I'll just have me. I'll just get up in the morning, take two minutes and go talk about this. And I'll be on TV and radio yes. talking about that forever. It's getting pretty solid. I've it been is. making a few porns of me. It's just me and me. They don't sell well, do <laughs> no, they? No, no. I'm the only buyer. <laughs> right. right. It's, uh, it's like a fine wine. Yeah, you, get, you know, you have to no, develop but, uh, a taste for yes. it. Is there, anything, is there anything that is off limits? No. Yeah. I used to say to my writers, when we were doing, I was doing comedy shows early in my career. And um, I said, uh, I don't know, this this might be over the line. And I look at him, is it funny? If it's funny, never cut funny. Ever. That's the difference. Like, there has to be this level where it's like, if you're doing something for complete offense, just to be offensive. Right. Why? But if it's hilarious... Who cares? I mean, I've never felt that anything should be, if it's done the right way, is, is, no, never. And I've, and I've heard the most offensive jokes in the world. And everyone I've heard is funny. To me. I mean, I'm not saying everybody would like them. Right. But, you know, to me, funny. Yeah. But yeah, I don't find anything to be over the line. And maybe I'm somebody that can take it a little more. Like sometimes I'll be hanging out with people at a party and because I'm jaded, I'll say something and I'll be like, oh I man, I, yeah, yeah. And you're like, well, that's, uh, that's the one I shouldn't have gone with, you know, <laughs> and that's, and you realize to reel it in and yeah. amongst other people. Right. Yeah. I'm like, oh, right. You have a soul. <laughs> so it, it, it just depends. But for me, yeah, no, there's no line. Um. You look at uh, social media today and TikTok and you see, I don't know if you saw the new app that came out this week. Mm -mm. This is terrifying. It's a new app. It's a filter. It makes it doesn't work well with men, just women. Yeah. But it makes you absolutely model beautiful. And so I don't need it. (laughs) No, I can't work that many miracles no it's weird it doesn't (laughs) seem to work really well with men yeah but with women i mean you'll see these people and there's a couple they're like oh i don't look like that at all and it you know just they take the filter off and you're like really put a little bit of makeup on and you look like that right but then there's some that are just woof yeah and they are beautiful in the filter and every single woman that i saw Doing it said the same thing. This is so bad. Is it called Tinder? <laughs> <laughs> That's terrifying. Though. It's terrifying. All of the women are saying this is so bad. They want it, but they know this is horrible because I don't look like that. N- we're living in a time where we have this impossible standard of beauty while we're also trying to embrace the worst things about somebody. Now, I shouldn't say the worst, but if you happen to be obese, you happen to be these things that mm-hmm. people might find on a tra- whatever it mm-hmm. might be. I don't care, but it's like for other people, 
that's something that they might look at, however they are flawed, where we don't embrace flaw, but then we're supposed to embrace flaw. That's what I don't understand. We're living in a time where you go, okay, Lizzo's gorgeous. We want to love her for her body, whatever it is, while simultaneously saying, you're not good enough. You're not worth it. You should look this good. That's why we created this app. Mm -hmm. It's a confusion and a consumerism that I'll never understand. Mm -mm. So it just makes people feel like they they're, don't. But they're both lies. Correct. They're both lies. That's what I don't get. And then you have this reality in the middle that isn't acceptable, which is who you are and who you should be. And there's nothing like in men, we're, we're gross anyway. I yeah. don't I do not understand why women would even like. Could, I don't understand why other guys are interested in other guys, let alone women. I don't get it at all. <laughs> yeah. Like where you're like, because, yeah, I grew up around guys. It's like I do. They were disgusting, yeah, disgusting, just awful creatures. Yeah. And then you look at women and they're just works of art. Mm -hmm. And it's like you don't even need an app to realize how beautiful you are. Like you're go like you're made to be perfect. And then to have this on top of it, it's this competition with themselves that they don't even need to be having that creates an insecurity amongst them that they don't deserve. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I fight with all the time, because I realized uh, at one point last summer, I think our family, we were on vacation, and I think it was like the third day when I realized we hadn't said a genuine kind thing to one another in three days. <laughs> it's just, just wrecking. And I mean, all of us are just, we just keep stepping it up, you know? And, and I thought, I don't know if this is real healthy. <laughs> uh, uh, sarcasm is, uh, and I also realized a few years earlier unfortunately and i wish i mean this is tragic but i have a daughter with cerebral palsy and she's very mm -hmm. literal okay yeah oh yeah and um and i didn't re i didn't realize with all the sarcasm that's going on you know i know she's very literal but i didn't think like yeah but she gets sarcasm <laughs> right no uh and i i just i i find myself in this place where it's like i don't know is that good or bad sarcasm? It, it's, it, yeah, it's tough. I mean, if you know it for sure, I think it's, I it's think it's my it, favorite. It's good though to me. I mean, yeah, especially my son is very sarcastic. Who's like seven or eight. And like I'll be excited about something yeah. or like an accomplishment I had. Be, yeah. Oh, I just did this and it went really well. And you know, my son will just kind of go like, Oh yeah, dad, that's really good. You should be really proud of yourself. <laughs> And he's, he's, he's seven. I know. And he just walks away, and I'm I like, know. I'm like, that hurt a lot. <laughs> like, it's like, why did you just kick me? I know. And, you know, I know. And, and they get it though at this yeah. like young age. And we were driving the other day, and we were late, and my, to uh, going to my brother's house. And he goes, "That's fine. Your brother's always late. Why don't you just blame it on him like you always do?" <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, do I, I'm like, do I have two wives? You know, it's just, he'll just say stuff where, so I, I, yeah, I think it just depends, but I, I, I enjoy it. I think it's a fun way to be dry. I love it. Yeah. I had a, uh, a meeting with an executive at Premier Radio, uh, when they were first hiring me to do syndicated talk. Okay. And, uh, he was the vice president in charge of the talk industry. And, uh. So I had to go out and meet him. It was the last interview I had to do. And I sat at this steakhouse in New York City. And Paul Castellano was shot outside. <laughs> Sorry. And he was, he, everything he said, and I, I knew nothing about him and nobody warned me about this. Everything he said was either sarcastic or he was an ass. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I walked out of that building and i said i either love that guy or hate his guts <laughs> you know what i mean because if he's serious he's a monster <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but he's the kind of guy a uh, little like kaufman that he just enjoyed it himself and he wasn't doing it for anybody else's laughs he's j he just likes to just watch people yeah you know and uh turns out uh, he was very sarcastic, which worked out well for me. Yeah, he's <laughs> Otherwise, I probably would have been on a killing spree with him. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's, 
It's uh, it's bizarre. Um, let me ask you. Um, I had Jim Brewer on, I don't know, a couple months ago. Okay. Yeah, and I saw the interview. Yeah. He's funny. Yeah, Gosh, he he's is. funny. He really is. And uh, we talked afterwards, and I said, because uh, he's very spiritual, very spiritual. Yes. And uh, uh, I said, you got to do a comedy special on religion, because he can approach it in such a way where he's skeptical and you know all the true stories that he went through Mm -hmm. um that i think a lot of people because because religious people are always perceived as having a stick up their butt yeah of course Uh, yeah are you religious you were because you're you grew up catholic yes are you religious or are you spiritual are you nothing it's odd uh no no i believe in god um i do i pray i do um but i have battled with it at times and it was kind of being sober and finding a God, you know, that I believed and sort of taking pieces of what I thought different religions worked for me. And it's not that I don't believe in Catholicism. I was very, very angry at the church for what they covered up. That's just the truth. You were an altar boy. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Still. I mean, you still can't sit. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> Uh, no, my, it was my brother. But that, and, but that didn't happen to you. No, no, no. Thankfully, yeah. thankfully yeah. not. I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't that cute, cute. enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> I tried. Did you feel kind of like, yeah, I left you know, out. I, you it's not know, that I want it. But. I started dressing sexier. <laughs> I, uh, I would put glitter on before mass. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, that was disheartening to me though, because I, uh, even when my mom had killed herself, she was very devout. And we would go to church uh, sometimes three times a week mm. to the point where even God was like, you want to slow down? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> you're really becoming kind of a groupie. Yeah, it's been much, <laughs> you know, it's uh, like, look, I get it. You, you, you're doing it right. Right. Yeah. You know? um, but I am. Yeah, I am. And I do go to church here and there. And I, I wouldn't say that I'm, you know, certainly this very, very devout in the sense of I follow all the rules do everything right. I'm not, I very much just believe on, believe very strongly in treating other people well, being kind to other people and just praying to God, knowing that I am completely flawed in every way imaginable. And I try to do work on the side that I can do privately to help other people do what I do. This is not, this is now it feels kind of like, it will, it, like kind of like you're, you're saying too much, like, I'm covering, I, and I I help people on the weekends. Yeah, and I, yeah, 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 yeah. Look, I killed a guy <laughs> on the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, too much. Look, uh, I, I, when I used to drink, you know, you, you wake up in the morning and you you go, well, I hope that's deer blood <laughs> on the hood of my car. Uh, <laughs> I guess deers wear shoelaces. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, I am, but. It's like I can't say I'm a particular religion, to be honest with you. I guess is what I'm trying to say. I, I, I. But I don't hate the Catholic Church like I, I, I did for a minute, and that's the truth. Mm. Because I was very, very angry at what happened. But now that I've had priests come to my shows that are fans, they find the jokes funny. I've been able to open my eyes to go. Well, there was a serious problem going on. There may still be. So. <laughs> So the fact that they go to your show and find your filthy comedy yeah. funny doesn't make you question them as priests no, even more. I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of true. But like, I'll, I'll even go up to them and go, sorry about that whole altar boy part. And they'll be like, I'm just glad it went by quick. And, uh, <laughs> glad I wasn't wearing the collar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they'll be in like one of my shirts. Covered. Just. Um, yeah, I guess it, it's, it's hard for me to answer, you know, than, than a simple yes or no. Cause it's like, yes, I do believe in God and I do believe that there's something that has created us. But I, I, at the moment I'm trying to figure out not so much what that is, but what I believe fully Yeah, is the best I don't way. Think, I, I mean, I it. keep. But yeah, it does sound more where I'm like, no, I try to be nice. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't. I I, don't. I, I, I do stuff. Yeah, um, I've not. I, I, you know, I, I don't traffic no more. You know, it's just sort of. I don't traffic no. More. <laughs> yeah, I, just, uh, but I, I do believe in God. Yeah, I think. Uh, 
my father, when he died, um, he was so open-minded on almost everything. Um, and I really loved that about him. Uh, he could find the, he could find the joy other people had in things that he didn't necessarily agree with, you right. know, but he thought this is great. Mm -hmm. Um, and towards the end of his life, he became just so calcified and he became a different man. And I think the secret to never getting old and also probably to a better afterlife is just always question, always, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I know what I believe, but I could get to the other side and it's like nothing like that. Maybe it's that, you know, the elephant and the eight armed woman up there. Yeah, yeah. I'd be true, shocked. Right. I'd be shocked if it was. But I think about that. If I'm, you know, if I'm up there and I'm dead and that's the reality, I guess I'm like, I'm Hindu. Or yeah. whatever that really yeah, you're like, oh, is that weird. close enough? <laughs> or you just yeah, you wake up and you're a lizard and you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, and I thought about that too. Where I think that's <laughs> that's the part that bothers me sometimes about religion, where it's like I know exactly what happens and I judge you very hard for it, right? And it, and I don't know. All no. I know is nothing. And and I was raised to question everything. It's like when I was young, my dad was. I I saw JFK in the theater when I was nine, and like we would go to Gettysburg, we would go to all these history places, and that's where we. And I actually had interest in it as a kid, mm -hmm. but it was basically my dad saying, "Hey, the CIA killed this guy." I'm like nine, you know, and it's like don't trust anything, don't trust. And I always learned like don't necessarily believe anything that you see as fact. And that's how I grew up to believe everything is just don't necessarily believe, believe. what's on the surface. And like you said, always, always ask question. question. That's isn't how it, I was isn't raised. It crazy. I, I mean, I remember the JFK thing, you know, there was more shooters, blah, blah, blah. He was a CIA agent. When I got older, I could look into those things and go, well, maybe, yeah. I don't know, but maybe, but now it's starting to come out and you're like, good God, it looks like the CIA or somebody involved in the government did kill him. Yes. That, I mean, it's almost as if everything you believed is crumbling. And that is so dangerous because you, you got to hold on to something. Is there anything that was real? Do you feel like that ever? Yes, all the time. Because everything that I look at is somehow related to something that you were supposed to believe in. You were supposed to believe in some, you were supposed to believe in some level of decency and some level of protection. Mm. And the reality is, is, is all along it's been a level of power. And that's what bothers me about everything that's going on. It's the same thing with if people look at a global thing or everything that's going on right mm -hmm. now. What is the benefit of everything that's happened in the last few years? Power. Power. That's it. And what does power want? More power. That's it. They don't care. Mm -hmm. It's the same as, you know, I know that y you talk about certain things people had to take. <laughs> you know, you look at Woody Harrelson the other night on mm -hmm. SNL and how people are getting mad. And it's like, for what? For saying what happened? Mm -hmm. He just said what happened. Mm -hmm. That's all he said. Mm -hmm. And people are outraged. Why are you outraged? It's just what happened. Mm-hmm. That's the part I don't understand. Why did you not question it? Why did you think that that was a good... Again, I have every vaccine imaginable. The one that I didn't take was the one that seemed a little odd. Like, even in my special, when I talk about, you know, if I got the polio vaccine and the next morning I woke up <laughs> right. and I'm like, why are my legs all noodly? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, FDRing you know, yeah. across the floor. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like I would have questions. Mm -hmm. So I just kept noticing... Everybody was getting sick. So I'm like, well, this isn't effective. And I kept flying and I would go to like Florida or Alabama that would let me do shows. And people are like, you're the biggest germaphobe I know. Why are you flying? I'm like, there's no one on the plane. I get first class. I pay $80 <laughs> and then they pump me mm -hmm. up. No one's on the plane. I can still make money as a performer. I, I'm like, this is absurd. Like you putting a mask on with your germy hands is absurd. And it's because I grew up with somebody who was teaching me about germs constantly. So it all didn't add up. And the way that people didn't question it and politicized it made no sense and then switched. 
Like, the left was completely against Trump. He was at warp speed, all this. Don't take the vaccine. Don't do this. Don't then do that. for it. Yeah, then in one day, mm-hmm. they were like, yeah, you got to take Biden's vaccine. But, right. you know, you got to do this. You gotta, right. And, and they were against big pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. But in the worst in the worst pharmaceutical incident that I think maybe since Bear in Germany, uh, you're seeing that this is collusion with the government and it's all cover-ups. And yet those same people who were right to question pharmaceuticals yes. are now like, don't, don't say that about Pfizer. How dare yeah. you say that about Pfizer? Yeah, why would a company ever ever do something against you it's not like they created an epidemic of opioids <laughs> and I, i'm young enough to or you know and i'm old enough to remember where i worked at a pharmacy in the 90s which is a great place for a drug addict oh, to work it's really especially good. when they yeah. weren't really counting anything because right. you could just get a handful of valium and just throw some nickels in there you know but uh, uh it was uh i remember though the uh the oxy reps and the Vicodin reps. And I mean, you could have an oxy pen at the doctor's office, you know, like this was something that they were selling. Oh yeah. They were really pushing it, everything. And I'm not against opioids for the proper use of them. Right. I don't believe that anybody should have to live in pain. Not at all. You know, there's enough stuff to kill it, but you know, fentanyl is an end of life drug. That's what it says on the box. It's for For hospice. End of life use only. For yeah. hospice. Yeah. And sadly, I've lost, oh man, at least 15 friends in the last two years. From to fentanyl? That. Oh, yeah. Because it was in cocaine. And I don't know why people are still doing cocaine. But then it's in there. There's the tiniest bit. They don't know what it's for. They don't know if it's for, because they make it for a different degree of, you know, some's for people, some's for elephants, some's for the, you know, and then it ends up killing them. It's like, I wouldn't touch any of that stuff now, but that's a drug that is designed to kill you peacefully. Mm. And it's just being made and pumped out. Um, you're on the road now. Yes. Where are you going? Uh, I will be in, let's see, where am I going? Um, I'm going to the ice house in Pasadena, California. And then I will be at the comedy zone in Greenville, South Carolina. When are you at milk through your nose? Uh, I will be what uh, uh, every other Wednesday. <laughs> every other Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> right. Sounds like a club that would exist. <laughs> yeah, I'm at Yuck Yucks and Milk Through My Nose. Yeah, uh, I'm at Barn Yucks, uh, uh, Huckle House. Well, I I uh, I hope we see more of you. You're very Thank funny. You. Very I really funny. enjoy talking to you. Comedy specials just unbelievably offensive, but very funny. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Funny. Thank you. 